Now that I have an altogether different mess on my conscience, I know that I am a courageous man, but in those days I was not aware of it, and I remember being surprised by my own coolness. With the quiet murmured order one gives a sweat-stained distracted cringing trained animal even in the worst of plights, what mad hope or hate makes the young beast's flanks pulsate, what black stars pierce the heart of the tamer, I made low get up, and we decorously walked and then indecorously scuttled down to the car. Behind it a nifty station wagon was parked, and a handsome emissarian with a little blue-black beard, un Monsieur Trosbien, in silk shirt and magenta slacks, presumably the corpulent botanist's husband, was gravely taking the picture of a signboard giving the altitude of the pass. It was well over 10,000 feet and I was quite out of breath, and with a scrunch and a skid we drove off. Lo still struggling with her clothes and swearing at me in language that I never dreamed little girls could know, let alone use. There were other unpleasant incidents. There was the movie theater once, for example. Lo at the time still had for the cinema of irritable passion, it was to decline into tepid condescension during her second high school year. We took in, voluptuously and indiscriminately, oh, I don't know. 150 or 200 programs during that one year, and during some of the denser periods of movie going we saw many of the newsreels up to half a dozen times since the same weekly one went with different main pictures and pursued us from town to town. Her favorite kinds were, in this order, musicals, underworlders, westerners. In the first, Real singers and dancers had unreal stage careers in an essentially grief-proof sphere of existence where from death and truth were banned, and where, at the end, white-haired, dewy-eyed, technically deathless, the initially reluctant father of a show-crazy girl always finished by applauding her apotheosis on fabulous Broadway. The underworld was a world apart, there, heroic newspapermen were tortured, telephone bills ran to billions, and, in a robust atmosphere of incompetent marksmanship, villains were chased through sewers and storehouses by pathologically fearless cops, I was to give them less exercise. Finally there was the mahogany landscape, the florid-faced, blue-eyed rough riders, the prim pretty school teacher arriving in roaring gulch, the rearing horse, the spectacular stampede, the pistol thrust through the shivered window pane, the stupendous fist fight the crashing mountain of dusty old-fashioned furniture, the table used as a weapon, the timely somersault, the pinned hand still groping for the dropped bowie knife, the grunt, the sweet crash of fist against chin, the kick in the belly, the flying tackle, and immediately after a plethora of pain that would have hospitalized a Hercules, I should know by now, nothing to show but the rather becoming bruise on the bronze cheek of the warmed-up hero embracing his gorgeous frontier bride. I remember one matinee in a small airless theater crammed with children and reeking with the hot breath of popcorn. The moon was yellow above the neckerchiefed crooner, and his finger was on his string, and his foot was on a pine log, and I had innocently encircled Lo's shoulder and approached my jawbone to her temple, when two harpies behind us started muttering the queerest things I do not know if I understood aright, but what I thought I did, made me withdraw my gentle hand and of course the rest of the show was fog to me. Another jolt I remember is connected with a little berg we were traversing at night, during our return journey. Some twenty miles earlier I had happened to tell her that the day school she would attend at Beardsley was a rather high-class, non-coeducational one, with no modern nonsense, whereupon Lo treated me to one of those furious harangues of hers where entreaty and insult, self-assertion and double talk, vicious vulgarity and childish despair, were interwoven in an exasperating semblance of logic which prompted a semblance of explanation from me. Enmeshed in her wild words, swell chance. I'd be a sap if I took your opinion seriously. Stinker. You can't boss me. I despise you. And so forth, I drove through the slumbering town at a 50 mile per hour pace in continuance of my smooth highway swoosh and a twosome of patrolmen put their spotlight on the car, and told me to pull over. I shushed Lo who was automatically raving on. The men peered at her and me with malevolent curiosity. Suddenly all dimples, she beamed sweetly at them, 
as she never did at my Arcadius masculinity, for, in a sense, Milo was even more scared of the law than I and when the kind officers pardoned us and servilely we crawled on, her eyelids closed and fluttered as she mimicked limp prostration. At this point I have a curious confession to make. You will laugh but really and truly I somehow never managed to find out quite exactly what the legal situation was. I do not know it yet. Oh, I have learned a few odds and ends. Alabama prohibits a guardian from changing the ward's residence without an order of the court, Minnesota, to whom I take off my hat, provides that when a relative assumes permanent care and custody of any child under 14, the authority of a court does not come into play. Query, is the stepfather of a gaspingly adorable pubescent pet, a stepfather of only one month's standing? an erotic widower of mature years and small but independent means, with the parapets of Europe, a divorce and a few madhouses behind him, is he to be considered a relative, and thus a natural guardian? And if not, must I, and could I reasonably dare notify some welfare board and file a petition, how do you file a petition? And have a court's agent investigate meek, fishy me and dangerous Dolores Hayes? The many books on marriage rape, adoption and so on, that I guiltily consulted at the public libraries of big and small towns, told me nothing beyond darkly insinuating that the state is the super guardian of minor children. Pilvin and Zippel, if I remember their names right, in an impressive volume on the legal side of marriage, completely ignored stepfathers with motherless girls on their hands and knees. My best friend, a social service monograph Chicago, 1936, which was dug out for me at great pains form a dusty storage recess by an innocent old spinster, said there is no principle that every minor must have a guardian, the court is passive and enters the fray only when the child's situation becomes conspicuously perilous. A guardian, I concluded, was appointed only when he expressed his solemn and formal desire but months might elapse before he was given notice to appear at a hearing and grow his pair of grey wings, and in the meantime the fair demon child was legally left to her own devices which, after all, was the case of Dolores Hayes. Then came the hearing. A few questions from the bench, a few reassuring answers from the attorney, a smile, a nod, a light drizzle outside, and the appointment was made. And still I dared not. Keep away be a mouse, curl up in your hole. Courts became extravagantly active only when there was some monetary question involved, two greedy guardians, a robbed orphan, a third, still greedier, party. But here all was in perfect order, and inventory had been made, and her mother's small property was waiting untouched for Dolores Hayes to grow up. The best policy seemed to be to refrain from any application. Or would some busybody, some humane society, but and if I kept too quiet? Friend Farlow, who was a lawyer of sorts and ought to have been able to give me some solid advice, was too much occupied with Jean's cancer to do anything more than what he had promised namely, to look after Curlot's meager estate while I recovered very gradually from the shock of her death. I had conditioned him into believing Dolores was my natural child, and so could not expect him to bother his head about the situation. I am, as the reader must have gathered by now, a poor businessman, but neither ignorance nor indolence should have prevented me from seeking professional advice elsewhere. What stopped me was the awful feeling that if I meddled with fate in any way and tried to rationalize her fantastic gift, that gift would be snatched away like that palace on the mountaintop in the Oriental tale which vanished whenever a prospective owner asked its custodian how come a strip of sunset sky was clearly visible from afar between Black Rock and Foundation. I decided that at Beardsley, the site of Bearsley College for Women, I would have access to works of reference that I had not yet been able to study such as Warner's Treatise on the American Law of Guardianship and certain United States Children's Bureau publications. I also decided that anything was better for Lo than the demoralizing idleness in which she lived. I could persuade her to do so many things their list might stupefy a professional educator, but no matter how I pleaded or stormed, I could never make her read any other book than the so-called comic books or stories in magazines for American females. 
any literature a peg higher smack to her of school, and though theoretically willing to enjoy a girl of the limber lost or the Arabian Nights, or Little Women, she was quite sure she would not fritter away her vacation on such highbrow reading matter. I now think it was a great mistake to move east again and have her go to that private school in Beardsley, instead of somehow scrambling across the Mexican border while the scrambling was good so as to lie low for a couple of years in subtropical bliss until I could safely marry my little Creole, for I must confess that depending on the condition of my glands and ganglia, I could switch in the course of the same day from one pole of insanity to the other from the thought that around 1950 I would have to get rid somehow of a difficult adolescent whose magic nymphage had evaporated to the thought that with patience and luck might have her produce eventually an infet with my blood in her exquisite veins, a Lolita II, who would be eight or nine around 1960, when I would still be Don's law for still age, indeed, the telescopy of my mind, or on mind was strong enough to distinguish in the remoteness of time of Ayala Erd on Corvert or was it Green Rock question mark bizarre, tender, salivating drive. Humbert, practicing on supremely lovely Lolita III the art of being a granddad. In the days of that wild journey of ours, I doubted not that as father to Lolita I I was a ridiculous failure. I did my best, I read and reread a book with the unintentionally biblical title Know Your Own Daughter which I got at the same store where I bought Lo, for her 13th birthday, a deluxe volume with commercially beautiful illustrations, of Anderson's The Little Mermaid. But even at our very best moments, when we sat reading on a rainy day, Lo's glance skipping from the window to her wrist watch and back again, or had a quiet hearty meal in a crowded diner, or played a childish game of cards, or went shopping, or silently stared, with other motorists and their children, at some smashed, blood-bespattered car with a young woman's shoe in the ditch, lo, as we drove on, that was the exact type of moccasin I was trying to describe to that jerk in the store, on all those random occasions, I seemed to myself as implausible a father as she seemed to be a daughter. Was, perhaps, guilty locomotion instrumental in vitiating our powers of impersonation? Would improvement be forthcoming with a fixed domicile and a routine schoolgirl's day? In my choice of Beardsley I was guided not only by the fact of there being a comparatively sedate school for girls located there, but also by the presence of the women's college. In my desire to get myself case, to attach myself somehow to some pattern surface which my stripes would blend with, I thought of a man I knew in the Department of French at Beardsley College, he was good enough to use my textbook in his classes and had attempted to get me over once to deliver a lecture. I had no intention of doing so, since, as I have once remarked in the course of these confessions, there are few physiques I loathe more than the heavy low-slung pelvis, thick calves and deplorable complexion of the average co-ed, in whom I see, maybe, the coffin of coarse female flesh within which my nymphets are buried alive but I did crave for a label, a background, and a simulacrum, and, as presently will become clear, there was a reason, a rather zany reason, why old Gaston Godin's company would be particularly safe. Finally, there was the money question. My income was cracking under the strain of our joy ride. True, I clung to the cheaper motor courts, but every now and then, there would be a loud hotel deluxe, or a pretentious to drench to mutilate our budget, staggering sums, moreover, were expended on sightseeing and Lowe's clothes, and the old Hayes bus, although a still vigorous and very devoted machine, necessitated numerous minor and major repairs. In one of our strip maps that has happened to survive among the papers which the authorities have so kindly allowed me to use for the purpose of writing my statement, I find some jottings that help me compute the following. During that extravagant year 1947 to 1948, August to August, lodgings and food cost us around $5,500, gas, oil and repairs, $1,234, and various extras almost as much, so that during about 150 days of actual motion, we covered about 27,000 miles, plus some 200 days of interpolated standstills, this modest rentier spent around $8,000, or 
or better say 10,000 because, unpractical as I am, I have surely forgotten a number of items. And so we rolled east, I more devastated than braced with the satisfaction of my passion, and she glowing with health, her bileac garland still as brief as a lad's, although she had added two inches to her stature and eight pounds to her weight. We had been everywhere. We had really seen nothing. And I catch myself thinking that our long journey had only defiled with a sinuous trail of slime the lovely, trustful, dreamy, enormous country that by then, in retrospect, was no more to us than a collection of dog-eared maps, ruined tour books, old tires, and her sobs in the night every night, every night the moment I feign sleep. 4. When, through decorations of light and shade, we drove to 14 Thayer Street, a grave little lad met us with the keys and a note from Gaston who had rented the house for us. My Lo, without granting her new surroundings one glance, unseeingly turned on the radio to which instinct led her and lay down on the living room sofa with a batch of old magazines which in the same precise and blind manner she landed by dipping her hand into the nether anatomy of a lamp table. I really did not mind where to dwell provided I could lock my Lolita up somewhere, but I had. I suppose, in the course of my correspondence with Veg Gaston, vaguely visualized a house of ivied brick. Actually the place bore a dejected resemblance to the Hayes home, a mere 400 distant, it was the same sort of dull grey frame affair with a shingled roof and dull green drill awnings, and the rooms, though smaller and furnished in a more consistent plush and plate style, were arranged in much the same order. My study turned out to be, however, a much larger room, lined from floor to ceiling with some 2,000 books on chemistry which my landlord, on sabbatical leave for the time being, taught at Beardsley College. I had hoped Beardsley School for Girls, an expensive day school, with lunch thrown in and a glamorous gymnasium, would, while cultivating all those young bodies, provide some formal education for their minds as well. Gaston Godin who was seldom right in his judgment of American habitus, had warned me that the institution might turn out to be one of those where girls are taught, as he put it with a foreigner's love for such things, not to spell very well, but to smell very well. I don't think they achieved even that. At my first interview with headmistress Pratt, she approved of my child's nice blue eyes, blue. Lolita, and of my own friendship with that French genius, a genius. Gaston. And then, having turned Dolly over to a Miss Cormorant, she wrinkled her brow in a kind of reculement and said, We are not so much concerned, Mr. Humbird, with having our students become bookworms or be able to reel off all the capitals of Europe which nobody knows anyway, or learn by heart the dates of forgotten battles. What we are concerned with is the adjustment of the child to group life. This is why we stress the four Ds, dramatics, dance, debating, and dating. We are confronted by certain facts. Your delightful Dolly will presently enter an age group where dates, dating, date dress, date book, date etiquette, mean as much to her as, say, business, business connections, business success, mean to you, or as much as, smiling, the happiness of my girls means to me. Dorothy Humbert is already involved in a whole system of social life which consists, whether we like it or not, of hot dog stands, corner drug stores, malts and cokes, movies, square dancing, blanket parties on beaches, and even hair fixing parties. Naturally at Beardsley School we disapprove of some of these activities, and we rechannel others into more constructive directions. But we do try to turn our backs on the fog and squarely face the sunshine. To put it briefly, while adopting certain teaching techniques, we are more interested in communication than in composition. That is, with due respect to Shakespeare and others, we want our girls to communicate freely with the live world around them rather than plunge into musty old books. We are still groping perhaps, but we grope intelligently, like a gynecologist feeling a tumor. We think, Dr. Humberg, in organismal and organizational terms. We have done away with the mass or irrelevant topics that have traditionally been presented to young girls, leaving no place, in former days, 
for the knowledges and the skills, and the attitudes they will need in managing their lives and as the cynic might add the lives of their husbands. Mr. Humberson, let us put it this way, the position of a star is important, but the most practical spot for a nice box in the kitchen may be even more important to the budding housewife. You say that all you expect a child to obtain from school is a sound education. But what do we mean by education? In the old days it was in the main a verbal phenomenon, I mean, you could have a child learn by heart a good encyclopedia and he or she would know as much as or more than a school could offer. Dr. Hummer, do you realize that for the modern pre-adolescent child, medieval dates are of less vital value than weekend ones, Twinkle? To repeat upon that I heard the Beardsley College psychoanalyst permit herself the other day. We live not only in a world of thoughts, but also in a world of things. WRDS without experience are meaningless. What on earth can Dorothy Hummerson care for Greece and the Orient with their harems and slaves? This program rather appalled me, but I spoke to two intelligent ladies who had been connected with the school, and they affirmed that the girls did quite a bit of sound reading and that the communication line was more or less Bally who aimed at giving old-fashioned Beardsley School a financially remunerative modern touch, though actually it remained as prim as a prawn. Another reason attracting me to that particular school may seem funny to some readers, but it was very important to me, for that is the way I am made. Across our street, exactly in front of our house, there was, I noticed, a gap of weedy wasteland, with some colorful bushes and a pile of bricks and a few scattered planks, and the foam of shabby mauve and chrome autumn roadside flowers, and through that gap you could see a shimmery section of school road, running parallel to our Thayer Street, and immediately beyond that, the playground of the school apart from the psychological comfort this general arrangement should afford me by keeping Dolly's day adjacent to mine, I immediately foresaw the pleasure I would have in distinguishing from my study bedroom, by means of powerful binoculars, the statistically inevitable percentage of nymphets among the other girl children playing around Dolly during recess, unfortunately, on the very first day of school, workmen arrived and put up a fence some way down the gap, and in no time a construction of tawny wood maliciously arose beyond that fence utterly blocking my magic vista, and as soon as they had erected a sufficient amount of material to spoil everything, those absurd builders suspended their work and never appeared again. 5. In a street called Thayer Street, in the residential green, fawn, and golden of a mellow academic townlet, one was bound to have a few amiable fine dares yelping at you. I prided myself on the exact temperature of my relations with them, never rude, always aloof. My west door neighbor, who might have been a businessman or a college teacher, or both, would speak to me once in a while as he barbered some late garden blooms or watered his car, or, at a later date, defrosted his driveway. I don't mind if these verbs are all wrong, but my brief grunts, just sufficiently articulate to sound like conventional assents or interrogative pause fillers, precluded any evolution toward chumminess. Of the two houses flanking the bit of scrubby waste opposite, one was closed, and the other contained two professors of English, Tweedy and short-haired Miss Lester and fadedly feminine Miss Fabian whose only subject of brief sidewalk conversation with me was called God bless their tact, the young loveliness of my daughter and the naive charm of Gaston Godin. My east door neighbor was by far the most dangerous one, a sharp-nosed stock character whose late brother had been attached to the college as superintendent of buildings and grounds. I remember her waylaying Dolly, while I stood at the living room window feverishly awaiting my darling's return from school. The odious spinster, trying to conceal her morbid inquisitiveness under a mask of dulcet goodwill, stood leaning on her slim umbrella, the sleet had just stopped, a cold wet sun had sidled out, and Dolly, her brown coat open despite the raw weather, her structural heap of books pressed against her stomach, her knees showing pink above her clumsy wellingtons, a sheepish frightened little smile flitting over and off her snub-nosed face, which owing perhaps to the pale wintry light looked almost plain, in a rustic, German, Magdalen-like way, as she stood there and dealt with Miss East's questions and where is your mother, my dear? 
And what is your poor father's occupation? And where did you love before? Another time the loathsome creature accosted me with a welcoming whine but I evaded her, and a few days later there came from her a note in a blue margined envelope, a nice mixture of poison and treacle, suggesting Dolly come over on a Sunday and curl up in a chair to look through the loads of beautiful books my dear mother gave me when I was a child, instead of having the radio on at full blast till all hours of the night. I had also to be careful in regard to a Mrs. Holigan a charwoman and cook of sorts whom I had inherited with the vacuum cleaner from the previous tenants. Dolly got lunch at school, so that this was no trouble, and I had become adept at providing her with a big breakfast and warming up the dinner that Mrs. Holigan prepared before leaving. That kindly and harmless woman had, thank God, a rather bleary eye that missed details, and I had become a great expert in bed making. But still I was continuously obsessed by the feeling that some fatal stain had been left somewhere, or that, on the rare occasions where Holigan's presence happened to coincide with Lowe's, Simple Low might succumb to buxom sympathy in the course of a cozy kitchen chat. I often felt we lived in a lighted house of glass, and any moment some thin-lipped parchment face would peer through a carelessly unshaded window to obtain a free glimpse of things that the most jaded voyeur would have paid a small fortune to watch. 6. A Word About Gaston Godin The main reason why I enjoyed or at least tolerated with relief his company was the spell of absolute security that his ample person cast on my secret. Not that he knew it. I had no special reason to confide in him, and he was much too self-centered and abstract to notice or suspect anything that might lead to a frank question on his part and a frank answer on mine. He spoke well of me to Beardsleyans, he was my good herald. Had he discovered Mskut's and Lolita's status, it would have interested him only insofar as throwing some light on the simplicity of my attitude towards him which attitude was as free of polite strain as it was of ribald delusions, for despite his colorless mind and dim memory, he was perhaps aware that I knew more about him than the burghers of Beardsley did. He was a flabby, dough-faced, melancholy bachelor tapering upward to a pair of narrow, not quite level shoulders and a conical pear head which had sleek black hair on one side and only a few plastered wisps on the other but the lower part of his body was enormous, and he ambulated with a curious elephantine stealth by means of phenomenally stout legs. He always wore black, even his tie was black, he seldom bathed, his English was a burlesque. And, nonetheless, everybody considered him to be a supremely lovable, lovably freakish fellow. Neighbors pampered him, he knew by name all the small boys in our vicinity. He lived a few blocks away from me and had some of them clean his sidewalk and burn leaves in his backyard, and bring wood from his shed, and even perform simple chores about the house, and he would feed them fancy chocolates, with real liquors inside in the privacy of an orientally furnished den in his basement, with amusing daggers and pistols arrayed on the moldy, rugged adorned walls among the camouflaged hot water pipes. Upstairs he had a studio he painted a little the old fraud. He had decorated its sloping wall, it was really not more than a garret, with large photographs of pensive André Gide, Tchaikovsky, Norman Douglas, two other well-known English writers, Nijinsky, Althais and Fig Leaves, Harold D. Double a a misty-eyed left-wing professor at a Midwestern university, and Marcel Proust. All these poor people seemed about to fall on you from their inclined plane. He had also an album with snapshots of all the Jackies and Dickies of the neighborhood, and when I happened to thumb through it and make some casual remark, Gaston would purse his fat lips and murmur with a wistful pout we, ill son gentles. His brown eyes would roam around the various sentimental and artistic bric-a-brac present, and his own now toy aisles, the conventionally primitive eyes, sliced guitars, blue nipples and geometrical designs of the day and with a vague gesture toward a painted wooden bowl or veined vase, he would say Prenez donc on de ces poyeurs. La bonne dame d'en face men offer plus cajine en puck savorer. Or, Mrs. Ta Yalorvent de me donner ces dahlias, belles fleurs cage soccer. Somber, sad, full of world weariness, 
For obvious reasons, I preferred my house to his for the games of chess we had two or three times weekly. He looked like some old battered idol as he sat with his pudgy hands in his lap and stared at the board as if it were a corpse. Wheezing he would mediate for ten minutes then make a losing move. Or the good man, after even more thought, might utter, O-R-O-I. With a slow old dog wolf that had a gargling sound at the back of it which made his jowls wobble, and then he would lift his circumflex eyebrows with a deep sigh as I pointed out to him that he was in check himself. Sometimes, from where we sat in my cold study I could hear Lowe's bare feet practicing dance techniques in the living room downstairs, but Gaston's outgoing senses were comfortably dulled, and he remained unaware of those naked rhythms and one, and two, and one, and two, way transferred on a straight right leg, leg up and out to the side, and one, and two, and only when she started jumping, opening her legs at the height of the jump, and flexing one leg, and extending the other, and flying, and landing on her toes only then did my pale, pompous, morose opponent rub his head or cheek a if confusing those distant thuds with the awful stabs of my formidable queen. Sometimes Lola would slouch in while we pondered the board and it was every time a treat to see Gaston, his elephant I still fixed on his pieces, ceremoniously rise to shake hands with her and forthwith release her limp fingers, and without looking once at her, descend again into his chair to topple into the trap I had laid for him. One day around Christmas, after I had not seen him for a fortnight or so, he asked me at Tout's Vaux Fillets, Els Vantpian? From which it became evident to me that he had multiplied my unique Lolita by the number of sartorial categories his downcast moody eye had glimpsed during a whole series of her appearances blue jeans, a skirt, shorts, a quilted robe. I am loath to dwell so long on the poor fellow, sadly enough, a year later, during a voyage to Europe, from which he did not return, he got involved in a sale his stowire, in neeps of all places. I would have hardly alluded to him at all had not his beardsly existence had such a queer bearing on my case. I need him for my defense. There he was devoid of any talent whatsoever a mediocre teacher, a worthless scholar, a glum repulsive fat old invert, highly contemptuous of the American way of life, triumphantly ignorant of the English language there he was in priggish a New England, crooned over by the old and caressed by the young O, oh, having a grand time and fooling everybody, and here was I. 7. I am now faced with the distasteful task of recording a definite drop in Lolita's morals. If her share in the ardors she kindled had never amounted to much, neither had pure lucre ever come to the fore. But I was weak, I was not wise, my schoolgirl nymph had had me in thrall. With a human element dwindling, the passion, the tenderness, and the torture only increased, and of this she took advantage. Her weekly allowance, paid to her under condition she fulfill her basic obligations, was 21 cents at the start of the Beardsley era and went up to $1.05 before its end. This was a more than generous arrangement seeing she constantly received from me all kinds of small presents and had for the asking any sweetmeat or movie under the moon although, of course, I might fondly demand an additional kiss, or even a whole collection of assorted caresses, when I knew she coveted very badly some item of juvenile amusement. She was, however, not easy to deal with. Only very listlessly did she earn her three pennies or three nickels per day, and she proved to be a cruel negotiator whenever it was in her power to deny me certain life-wrecking, strange, slow paradisal filters without which I could not live more than a few days in a row, and which, because of the very nature of love's languor, I could not obtain by force. Knowing the magic and might of her own soft mouth, she managed during one school year exclamation mark to raise the bonus price of a fancy embrace to three, and even four bucks. Oh reader! Laugh not, as you imagine me, on the very rack of joy noisily emitting dimes and quarters, and great big silver dollars like some sonorous, jingly and wholly demanded machine vomiting riches, and in the margin of that leaping epilepsy she would firmly clutch a handful of coins in her little fist, which, anyway, I used to pry open afterwards unless she gave me the slip, scrambling away to hide her loot. 
and just as every other day I would cruise all around the school area and on comatose feet visit drugstores, and peer into foggy lanes, and listen to receding girl laughter in between my heart throbs and the falling leaves, so every now and then I would burgle her room and scrutinize torn papers in the waste basket with the painted roses, and look under the pillow of the virginal bed I had just made myself. Once I found eight one-dollar notes in one of her books, fittingly Treasure Island, and once a hole in the wall behind Whistler's mother yielded as much as twenty-four dollars and some change say twenty-four sixty which I quietly removed, upon which, next day, she accused, to my face, honest Mrs. Holigan of being a filthy thief. Eventually, she lived up to her IQ by finding a safer hoarding place which I never discovered, but by that time I had brought prices down drastically by having her earn the hard and nauseous way permission to participate in the school's theatrical program, because what I feared most was not that she might ruin me, but that she might accumulate sufficient cash to run away. I believe the poor fierce-eyed child had figured out that with a mere fifty dollars in her purse she might somehow reach Broadway or Hollywood or the foul kitchen of a diner, help wanted, in a dismal ex-prairie state, with the wind blowing, and the stars blinking, and the cars, and the bars, and the barman, and everything soiled, torn, dead. 8. I did my best, Your Honor, to tackle the problem of boys. Oh. I used even to read in the Beardsley Star a so-called column for teens, to find out how to behave. A word to fathers. Don't frighten away daughter's friend. Maybe it is a bit hard for you to realize that now the boys are finding her attractive. To you she is still a little girl. To the boys she's charming and fun, lovely and gay. They like her. Today you clench big deals in an executive's office, but yesterday you were just high school Jim carrying Jane's school books. Remember? Don't you want your daughter, now that her turn has come, to be happy in the admiration and company of boys she likes? Don't you want your daughter, now that her turn has come, to be happy in the admiration and company of boys she likes? Don't you want them to have wholesome fun together? Wholesome fun? Good Lord. Why not treat the young fellows as guests in your house? Why not make conversation with them? Draw them out, make them laugh and feel at ease? Welcome, fellow, to this bordello. If she breaks the rules don't explode out loud in front of her partner in crime. Let her take the brunt of your displeasure in private. And stop making the boys feel she's the daughter of an old ogre. First of all the old ogre drew up a list under absolutely forbidden and another under reluctantly allowed. Absolutely forbidden were dates, single or double or triple the next step being of course mass orgy. She might visit a candy bar with her girlfriends, and there giggle chat with occasional young males, while I waited in the car at a discreet distance, and I promised her that if her group were invited by a socially acceptable group in Butler's Academy for Boys for their annual ball, heavily chaperoned, of course, I might consider the question whether a girl of 14 can don her first formal, a kind of gown that makes thin-armed teenagers look like flamingos. Moreover, I promised her to throw a party at our house to which she would be allowed to invite her prettier girlfriends and the nicer boys she would have met by that time at the butler dance. But I was quite positive that as long as my regime lasted she would never, never be permitted to go with a youngster in rut to a movie, or neck in a car, or go to boy-girl parties at the houses of schoolmates, or indulge out of my earshot in boy-girl telephone conversations even if only discussing his relations with a friend of mine. Lo was enraged by all this called me a lousy crook and worse and I would probably have lost my temper had I not soon discovered, to my sweetest relief, that what really angered her was my depriving her not of a specific satisfaction but of a general right. I was impinging, you see, on the conventional program, the stock pastimes, the things that are done, the routine of youth for there is nothing more conservative than a child, especially a girl child, be she the most auburn and russet, the most methopoeic nymphette in October's orchard haze. Do not misunderstand me. I cannot be absolutely certain that in the course of the winter she did not manage to have, in a casual way, 
improper contacts with unknown young fellows, of course, no matter how closely I controlled her leisure, there would constantly occur unaccounted for overtime leaks with over-elaborate explanations to stop them up in retrospect, of course, my jealousy would constantly catch its jagged claw in the fine fabrics of nymphet falsity, but I did definitely feel and can now vouchsafe for the accuracy of my feeling that there was no reason for serious alarm. I felt that way not because I never once discovered any palpable hard young throat to crush among the masculine mutes that flickered somewhere in the background, but because it was to me overwhelmingly obvious, a favorite expression with my Aunt Sybil, that all varieties of high school boys from the perspiring nincompoop whom holding hands thrills, to the self-sufficient rapist with pustules and a souped-up car equally bored my sophisticated young mistress. All this noise about boys gags me, she had scrawled on the inside of a school book, and underneath, in Mona's hand, Mona is due any minute now, there was the sly quip, what about rigor? Do too. Faceless, then, are the chappies I happen to see in her company. There was for instance Red Sweater who one day, the day we had the first snow saw her home, from the parlor window I observed them talking near our porch. She wore her first cloth coat with a fur collar, there was a small brown cap on my favorite hairdo the fringe in front and the swirl at the sides and the natural curls at the back and her damp dark moccasins and white socks were more sloppy than ever. She pressed as usual her books to her chest while speaking or listening, and her feet gestured all the time, she would stand on her left instep with her right toe, remove it backward, cross her feet, rock slightly, sketch a few steps and then start the series all over again. There was Windbreaker who talked to her in front of a restaurant one Sunday afternoon while his mother and sister attempted to walk me away for a chat, I dragged along and looked back at my only love. She had developed more than one conventional mannerism, such as the polite adolescent way of showing one is literally doubled up with laughter by inclining one's head, and so, as she sensed my call, still feigning helpless merriment. She walked backward a couple of steps, and then faced about, and walked toward me with a fading smile. On the other hand, I greatly liked perhaps because it reminded me of her first unforgettable confession her trick of sighing oh dear. In humorous wistful submission to fate, or emitting a long no oh in a deep almost growling undertone when the blow of fate had actually fallen. Above all since we are speaking of movement and youth I like to see her spinning up and down Thayer Street on her beautiful young bicycle, rising on the pedals to work on them lustily, then sinking back in a languid posture while the speed wore itself off, and then she would stop at our mailbox and, still astride, would flip through a magazine she found there, and put it back, and press her tongue to one side of her upper lip and push off with her foot and again sprint through pale shade and sun. On the whole she seemed to me better adapted to her surroundings than I had hoped she would be when considering my spoiled slave child and the bangles of demeanor she naively affected the winter before in California. Although I could never get used to the constant state of anxiety in which the guilty, the great, the tender-hearted live, I felt I was doing my best in the way of mimicry. As I lay on my narrow studio bed after a session of adoration and despair in Lolita's cold bedroom, I used to review the concluded day by checking my own image as it prowled rather than passed before the mind's red eye. I watched dark and handsome, not un-Celtic, probably high church, possibly very high church, Dr. Humbert see his daughter off to school I watched him greet with his slow smile and pleasantly arched thick black had eyebrows good Mrs. Holigan who smelled of the plague, and would head, I knew, for a master's gin at the first opportunity. With Mr. West, retired executioner or writer of religious tracts who cared question mark I saw neighbor what's his name, I think they are French or Swiss, meditate in his frank-windowed study over a typewriter, rather gaunt profiled, an almost Hitlerian cowlick on his pale brow. Weekends, wearing a well-tailored overcoat and brown gloves, Professor H. might be seen with his daughter strolling to Walton Inn, famous for its violet ribbon china bunnies and chocolate boxes among which you sit and wait for a table for two still filthy with your predecessor's crumbs. Seen on weekdays, around 1 p.m., 
saluting with dignity Argosides while maneuvering the car out of the garage and around the damned evergreens, and down onto the slippery road. Raising a cold eye from book to clock in the positively sultry Beardsley College Library, among bulky young women caught and petrified in the overflow of human knowledge, walking across the campus with the college clergyman, the Reverend Rigger, who also taught Bible in Beardsley School. Somebody told me her mother was a celebrated actress killed in an airplane accident. Oh? My mistake, I presume. Is that so? I see. How sad. Sublimating her mother, eh? Slowly pushing my little pram through the labyrinth of the supermarket, in the wake of Professor W., also a slow-moving and gentle widower with the eyes of a goat. Shoveling the snow in my shirt sleeves, a voluminous black and white muffler around my neck. Following with no show of rapacious haste, even taking time to wipe my feet on the mat, my schoolgirl daughter into the house. Taking Dolly to the dentist pretty nurse beaming at Herald Magazine's Neman Trespavos Ames. At dinner with Dolly in town, Mr. Edgar H. Humbert was seen eating his steak in the Continental Knife and Fork manner. Enjoying, in duplicate, a concert, two marble-faced, becomed Frenchmen sitting side by side, with Monsieur H. H. S. musical little girl on her father's right, and the musical little boy of Professor W. Father spending a hygienic evening in Providence, on Monsieur G. G. S. left. Opening the garage, a square of light that engulfs the car and is extinguished. Brightly pajamaed, jerking down the window shade in Dolly's bedroom. Saturday morning, unseen, solemnly weighing the winter bleached lassie in the bathroom. Seen and heard Sunday morning, no churchgoer after all, saying don't be too late to Dolly who is bound for the covered court. Letting in a queerly observant schoolmate of Dolly's, first time I've seen a man wearing a smoking jacket, sir except in movies, of course. 9. Her girlfriends, whom I looked forward to meet, proved on the whole disappointing. There was Opal something, and Linda Hall, and Davis Chapman, and Eva Rosen, and Mona Dahl, save one, all these names are approximations of course. Opal was a bashful, formless, bespectacled, bepimpled creature who doted on Dolly who bullied her. With Linda Hall the school tennis champion, Dolly played singles at least twice a week, I suspect Linda was a true nymphette, but for some unknown reason she did not come was perhaps not allowed to come to our house, so I recall her only as a flash of natural sunshine on an indoor court. Of the rest, None had any claims to nymphotry except Eva Rosen. Iris W.S. a plump lateral child with hairy legs, while Mona, though handsome in a coarse sensual way and only a year older than my aging mistress, had obviously long ceased to be an amphet, if she ever had been one. Eva Rosen, a displaced little person from France, was on the other hand a good example of a not strikingly beautiful child revealing to the perspicacious amateur some of the basic elements of nymphette charm, such as a perfect pubescent figure and lingering eyes and high cheekbones. Her glossy copper hair had Lolita's silkiness, and the features of her delicate milky white face with pink lips and silver fish eyelashes were less foxy than those of her likes the great clan of intra-racial redheads nor did she sport their green uniform but wore, as I remember her, a lot of black or cherry dark a very smart black pullover, for instance, and high-heeled black shoes, and garnet red fingernail polish. I spoke French to her, much to Lowe's disgust. The child's tonalities were still admirably pure, but for school words and play words she resorted to current American and then a slight Brooklyn accent would crop up in her speech which was amusing in a little Parisian who went to a select New England school with phony British aspirations. Unfortunately, despite that French kid's uncle being a millionaire, Lowe dropped Eva for some reason before I had had time to enjoy in my modest way her fragrant presence in the Humbert open house. The reader knows what importance I attached to having a bevy of page girls, consolation prize nymphettes, around my Alita. For a while, I endeavored to interest my senses in Mona Dahl who was a good deal around, especially during the spring term when Lo and she got so enthusiastic about dramatics. 
I have often wondered what secrets outrageously treacherous Dolores Hayes had imparted to Mona while blurting out to me by urgent and well-paid request various really incredible details concerning an affair that Mona had had with a marine at the seaside. It was characteristic of Lowe that she chose for her closest chum that elegant, cold, lascivious, experienced young female whom I once heard, misheard, Lowe swore cheerfully say in the hallway to Lo who had remarked that her, Lo's, sweater was a virgin wool, the only thing about you that is, kiddo. She had a curiously husky voice, artificially waved dull dark hair, earrings, amber-brown prominent eyes and luscious lips. Lo said teachers had remonstrated with her on her loading herself with so much costume jewelry. Her hands trembled. She was burdened with a 150 IQ and I also knew she had a tremendous chocolate brown Molani womanish back which I inspected the night low and she had worn low-cut pastel colored, vaporous dresses for a dance at the Butler Academy. I am anticipating a little, but I cannot help running my memory all over the keyboard of that school year. In the meeting my attempts to find out what kind of boys Lo knew, Miss Dahl was elegantly evasive. Lo who had gone to play tennis at Linda's country club had telephoned she might be a full half hour late, and so, would I entertain Mona who was coming to practice with her a scene from The Taming of the Shrew. Using all the modulations, all the allure of manner and voice she was capable of and staring at me with perhaps could I be mistaken question mark a faint gleam of crystalline irony, beautiful Mona replied, well, sir. The fact is Dolly is not much concerned with mere boys. Fact is, we are rivals. She and I have a crush on the Reverend Rigger. This was a joke I have already mentioned that gloomy giant of a man, with the jaw of a horse, he was to bore me to near murder with his impressions of Switzerland at a tea party for parents that I am unable to place correctly in terms of time, how had the ball been? Oh, it had been a riot. A what? A panic. Terrific, in a word. Had Lo danced a lot? Oh, not a frightful lot, just as much as she could stand. What did she, languorous Mona, think of Lo? Sir? Did she think Lo was doing well at school? Gosh, she certainly was quite a kid. But her general behavior was? Oh, she was a swell kid. But still? Oh, she's a doll, concluded Mona, and sighed abruptly and picked up a book that happened to lie at hand, and with a change of expression, falsely furrowing her brow, inquired, Do tell me about Balzac, sir. Is he really that good? She moved up so close to my chair that I made out through lotions and creams her uninteresting skin scent. A sudden odd thought stabbed me, was Milo playing the pimp? If so, she had found the wrong substitute. Avoiding Mona cool gaze, I talked literature for a minute. Then Dolly arrived and slid her pale eyes at us. I left the two friends to their own devices. One of the latticed squares in a small cobwebby casement window at the turn of the staircase was glazed with ruby, and that raw wound among the unstained rectangles and its asymmetrical position a night's move from the trop always strangely disturbed me.